in one of the darkest times in human history, when the voice of God was silent for 400 years. Suddenly, without notice and without provocation, redemption came to all men. And on an old rugged cross, on the stony hills of Calvary outside of the city of Jerusalem, the sins of mankind were redeemed one final time as God expresses his love for all of man when he poured his wrath on his son at a cross and it appeared that evil had won he rose and he was resurrected he lives that we may live Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Voice in the Wilderness Ministries. We're having entirely too much fun in studio this morning. We thank you for being a part of what God is doing. We want to speak to you about a very important, probably one of the most important subjects in the Christian faith. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The greatest obstacle in the endeavor to reach the lost of this world is not the looming threat of a worldwide authoritative regime seeking to control all of mankind. The greatest danger to the church in America is not the ominous signs of a Marxist socialist movement that threatens our way of life. It is not the politically and socially divisive culture that troubles the waters of the soul. It is not the loss of the objectivity of the media that is brazenly escalating the threat of a potential civil war. It is not the crime wave nor the mass, mass anarchy taking over our streets that stirs the fear of the hearts of the faith. All of these are signs of a civilization that has forgotten the judgment of God. None of this is anything new in the history of mankind. These types of self-destructive behaviors have brought down civilizations for centuries and will continue to do so until the Lord returns. But for nearly a century, the, the, the mantle of the sanctity of the church has eroded away and a worldly counterfeit has replaced it. Looking far more like the world it's supposed to be winning and with a narrative that speaks like the world is supposed to be winning, we seem to have discarded the central message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and replaced it with everything else. The church, by and large, with few exceptions, has stopped caring about the lost souls of this world. That's what's become the most frightening. This has become our most serious threat. But the true gospel message will remain intact, secured by a faithful remnant, to preach the repentance and remission of sins to the lost until Christ returns. In Luke 4, 24, 45 through 48, we get the mandate that Christ gave us. He opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoove that Christ should suffer and be raised from the dead on the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning here at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Luke, Acts, excuse me, Acts 2, 37 through 38. The Bible says, Now when they heard this, meaning Peter's sermon at Pentecost, they were pricked in their hearts and said, said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, what, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then said Peter, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshment shall come at the presence of the Lord. I say this to you because all through the internet, there is a progressive doctrine forming in the Christian church that seeks to eliminate the requirement of repentance to be saved. 
This is the forerunner. This is the backdrop. This is the pillar. This is the benchmark of gospel preaching. And no amount of preaching, no matter high sounding or the appearance of success, is going to change that. Without the repentance and remission of sins, there is no such thing as salvation. You can send all the hate mail you want. The blueprint has just, the scriptural blueprint has just been given to you. There are no exceptions. Everyone must understand that until your sins are dealt with, you are not in fellowship and in communion and have peace with God. Nowhere in the scriptures does it, does it imply that we are called to preach the gospel of forgiveness of sins without the demand of any personal repentance of our own personal sins. Any priest, minister, pastor, prophet, teacher, or church leaders that offers no salvation or a salvation offers a salvation based on an easy faith devoid of any commitment to obey Christ and His Word preaches a false gospel. The tragedy of our time is an, that an ageless message of hope for all men and the bold and thunderous declarations of anointed men from the pulpits calling men to repentance has grown conspicuously quiet in its absence in today's modern church. We have preached about the dignity and value of men rather than the depravity of their sinful state, offering no hope out of their darkness. We have emphasized the goodness of mankind rather than the wickedness of his damnable sinful nature. We have vindicated and validated men rather than bringing them to the confession of their transgressions. We have made ourselves, despite every drop of our inerrant sin and evil nature, little cherubs of perfection with halos on our heads, harps in our hands, and wings on our shoulders. Apparently, in today's generation, the necessity of the message of repentance and regeneration has passed. Where have the prayer virgils gone for the souls of men? Where are the intercessors' tear-stained cheeks of godless sorrow for their sins and the sins of, the, of all men? What happened to fasting and praying for the altars of our churches to be filled with souls hungry for God? The truth is the word sinner has almost been eradicated completely from the church, from the corporate church vocabulary. The serial criminal is no longer looked upon in contempt by society. Rather, he is just misguided and in need of rehabilitation. The juvenile delinquent is no longer looked upon as incorrigible and in need of serious discipline. He is just an unfortunate victim of society. The drunkard or the addict is not looked upon as a wayward, selfish man. He is mentally ill and cannot be expected to truly change his ways. But to the biblically discerning and to the seekers who, of truth who look for it, the Bible is an open invitation for men to repent of their sins. In Ezekiel 14, verse 6, the Bible says, Turn from your idols. Jeremiah 26, 3, the scripture says, Turn every man from his evil ways. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it says, Turn from your evil ways. Proverbs 1, 23, Turn away from your sins at my correction. In Psalm 85, verse 8, the Bible says, Turn not again to folly. In Matthew 3, verse 2, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 3, verse 8, the Bible says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. In Luke 3, verse 3, the Bible says, he preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. In Luke 13, 3 and 5, twice he says, unless you repent, you are going to perish. In Luke 24, verse 47, once again, the Great Commission, the call to preach the gospel, to reach the lost, to save the world, to bring the light of Jesus Christ, is encapsulized in this statement, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations, beginning here at Jerusalem. Again, in Acts 2, verse 38, the Bible says, repent and be baptized. In Acts 3.19, once again, repent ye therefore and be converted. In Acts 17, verse 30, the Bible says, God hath commanded men everywhere to repent. 
In 2 Timothy, the Bible says, repentance leads to the knowledge of the truth. The historical exculpation caused the forefathers who carried this torch for us to write about repentance often. For example, Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation, said the recognition of sin is the beginning of salvation. The recognition of sin is the beginning of salvation. And Thomas Watson said, Men do not repent because of the offense, their offense bothers them. They repent because the penalty of sin troubles them. Lord Byron said the beginning of salvation is the sense of its necessity. Augustine of Hippo wrote, He who created us without our help will not save us without our consent. The Bible is a mirror of the condition of fallen men's souls. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, the Bible says, The Word presents a man's righteousness as filthy rags in his sight. In Jeremiah 23, verse 29, the Bible says, The Word is a hammer to break the will of man. Malachi 3, verse 2, The Word is a fire to melt the heart. In Hebrews 4, verse 12, the Bible says, The Word is a sword to pierce the conscience. In 1 Peter 1, 21, the word is a seed, 1 Peter 1, 21, the word is a seed to quicken the soul. In Ephesians 5, 26, the Bible says, the word labors to cleanse a man's ways. In Psalm 119, verse 5, the word is a light to show us the way. In Hebrews 4, 12, it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Repentance is littered throughout the Old Testament. Consider the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 1, verses 18 through 20, the Bible says, Come now, the Lord speaking to the people, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be like wool. If you will be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. I would like to take a moment to present you with a picture of a period of time similar to the times that we live in today. Isaiah was a person, pro, excuse me, a prophet in a period <coughs> of spiritual declension in the land of Israel approximately 800 years before the time of Christ. In the backdrop of the theater of your mind, I want you to picture this rugged man storming into the city of Jerusalem, dramatically arrayed in sackcloth and ashes, and with fire in his eyes. Israel had been prosperous and peaceful under the reign of King Uzziah, one of the best kings of Judea. But in King Uzziah's later years, he had slipped away from his communion with God. His leadership was compromised as he had grown complacent and immortality had snuck into the culture. They went from serving the living God and were now serving other gods. At the height of Judah, Judah's sin, in comes Isaiah the prophet with his eyes blazing, dressed in sackcloth and ashes. And on the day of atonement, he stands on the steps of the temple, and he, with a booming voice, shouts to all of Israel, Repent, or the sword of God shall fall on you. The entire Old Testament thunders on the heavenly celestial call for men to repent and turn back to God. In Proverbs 28, verse 13, the Bible says, He that covers his sins shall not prosper, but he that confesses and forsakes his sin shall have mercy. He that covers his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesses and forsakes his sin shall have mercy. In Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, the Bible says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him turn to the Lord and he shall have mercy upon him and to our God and he shall abundantly pardon. 
In Jeremiah 4, verse 1, the Bible says, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return to me, and if thou wilt put away thy abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be destroyed. In Ezekiel 14, verse 6, the Bible says, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. In Ezekiel 18, verse 30, the Bible says, Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Listen, repent and turn yourselves from your abominations, so your iniquity will not utterly be your destruction. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, the Bible says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O Israel, and why will you die, O sinner in this world? Turn your hearts to Christ. Turn your hearts to God. Repent of your sins and receive the love and the grace and the mercy of your God. In Joel 2, verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn unto me with turn unto me even with all of your heart, and with fasting and weeping and mourning. But the New Testament, the new covenant God makes with men, you will find a much greater emphasis on repentance in God's redemptive work. The biblical foundation of repentance unto salvation appears to be the key that unlocks the narrow door and the straight gate and grants complete access to God through the cross of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 3, verse 2, John the Baptist come, repeat, repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In Matthew 4, 17, the Bible says, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In <clears throat> excuse me, Matthew 18, verse 3, the Bible says, except you be converted, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. In Mark 1, verse 15, the time is filled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. In Mark 6, verse 12, the Bible says that the disciples went out and preached that men should repent. Repentance. Luke 5, 32, Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. In Luke 13, verses 3 through 5, except you repent... You are all going to perish. These are the words of Christ. There are some people out there saying Jesus never said anything about repentance. And in, in five verses in one chapter, he says it twice. That except you repent, you're going to perish. Except you repent, you're going to perish. Don't buy the lies of the TikTok and the internet false prophets. It's right here in the Bible. Except you repent, you're going to die. It's not a message of hate or judgment. God is a holy God. God is a loving God. But your sin, which is a result of your behavior, has separated from you, and he is not to be blamed for the way you act in his sight, and the, and the response you get is punishment. Luke 24, verse 47, it is incumbent upon every single minister Every single man who takes the name of minister, pastor, prophet, or whatever office you hold, that the salvation of the soul has always been and will always be the central will of God in the Scriptures. From Genesis 3, when the first sin appeared, until the book of Revelation, when all things become complete, the salvation of the soul has been the will of God for the entire Scripture. There is nothing more important to Him than seeing sinners saved and enter into the kingdom of God. In John 3, verses 3 and 5, the scripture says, Except a man is born again, he is not going to see the kingdom of God. Except a man is born of water and the Spirit, he's not going to enter into the kingdom of God. In Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Acts 3, 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. <coughs> Excuse me. In Acts 22, the Bible says, Repent ye therefore of this wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Acts 20, verse 21. 
Repent ye there, excuse me, <clears throat> testifying both to the Jews and the Gentiles, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 26, 18, the Bible says that the Gentiles should repent and turn back to God. In Romans 2, verse 4, the Bible says, not knowing that it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, this is the most succinct example of how a prayer or giving your life to Jesus should be. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In Revelation 2, verse 5, speaking to the church of Ephesus, Remember from where you have come, and when thou art fallen, and repent. Revelation 3, verse 3, Remember therefore thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast to the truth, and repent. In Revelation 2, 19, the Bible says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight thee with the sword of my mouth. God has called men everywhere to repent even right now, to repent of their sins. This is not a trend, a fad, or something that will go out of style. It's not optional. The Bible demands it. Our wickedness commands it. True justice requires it. Christ preached it. The Spirit compels it, and God expects it. This divine, unalterable edict is still valid to every person that takes the name of Christ and holds an office, and even not so much as that. This is who we are. God is still commanding men everywhere to repent. On the other hand, in a climate of cultural, political correctness, cancel culture, and woke ideologies, no one is to blame for their conduct in this bizarre climate of upholding the dignity of mankind. We have vindicated all and condemned none. We accept every excuse, blame everyone else, play the eternal victim, and have an alibi for each and every offender. It's amazing the contrast of right and wrong and how it is now defined in this world. Hence, since every person, criminal, drunkard, murderer, delinquent, extortioner, pervert, sexual predator, abuser, or offender of God's law is not found guilty in the court of public opinion, we have come to a place in the church where there is no need for repentance. Even most of the church, particularly the church in the United States, has adopted this demonic doctrine. But without confession and repentance of sins, no man is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Without the repentance and remission of sins, no man is going to enter the kingdom of God indiscriminate of the empires you have built based on your perception of the Bible, which is not led by the Holy Spirit if it's not directed to lost souls and people struggling with this life. If all you're going to do is preach to the choir, you are doing no more than the sinner does and his community as well. It is the soul of the sinner that compels the heart of God to save men. But there is a stirring in the clouds of the heavenlies, and God is once again calling the ministers again with the sound of biblical repentance. But what is genuine repentance? What constitutes true repentance? Because even in repentance, the devil can offer a counterfeit version. The Bible explains the difference between genuine repentance and worldly sorrow in, in the scripture that we have given you, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Consider the contrast. There's three contrasts here in this scripture. Two are spoken and one is unspoken. There is a genuine sorrow, regret for sin that leads to repentance that causes us to turn from our sin unto God. 
This type of repentance directs us to a place of salvation. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. Genuine sorrow and regret for sin that leads to repentance causes us to turn from our sin to God. On the other hand, the unrepentant sorrow only about the consequence of our sin. They are sorry they got caught, and though seemingly sincere in the sight of men, God deems such sorrow as still worthy of eternal death and judgment. And the third unbiblical element in the, in the narrative of Christianity today about repentance, and it is the most damnable, no mention of it at all. So what is true repentance? What do we look for in a sinner coming to Christ to know and understand that their heart is going in the right direction? First of all, let me tell you what repentance, repentance is not. Number one, repentance is not penance. Penance is the voluntary suffering of punishment for sin. But the problem with that is it does not necessarily involve a change of character or conduct. The Hindu who lays on a bed of spikes is doing penance for his sins. But that does not mean his guilt in the sight of God is removed. Number two, repentance is not remorse. Judas Iscariot was the most remorseful person in the Bible in this betrayal of the Son of God. But his shallow regret did not lead him to God, but it sent him to the gallows. Because remorse is not true repentance. Many a person stains their tears, their pillow with tears because of their inadequacy to cope with the evils of this life, but remorse unto itself has no real redemptive value. It tells the sinner he is wrong, but like the diagnostician that it is, it offers no cure for the sickness. Number three, and this is very important, in a world filled with more suicides than ever before, repentance is not self-condemnation. You may hate your sinfulness, but self-condemnation only opens the wounds of guilt and despair even wider. We should hate our false ways. We should hate our sin. We should hate our vain thoughts. We should hate our evil passions. We should hate our covetousness and our greed, but we are to never hate ourselves. We are to never hate <clears throat> ourselves. Self-hatred leads to self-destruction, and it's wrong to destroy what God has created in His image. Repentance is not self-destruction. So what is true repentance? <clears throat> there are three elements of genuine repentance. Number one, conviction. You must know what is right before you can know what is wrong. That's why the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the words. You can worship God, but you'll never change your ways until you understand what God's personal words are concerning your conduct. You cannot know it's wrong if you don't it right if you do not know it's wrong. We are living in a world of moral relativism. Only the Holy Spirit can bring us to true conviction. The Holy Ghost uses conviction to convince you your life is going the wrong way. If that's <coughs> excuse me. If that's what's happening and what's going on inside of you right now, you are the most blessed of people. Not all men in this present state can experience this God-given state of conviction. We must treat them all like they can, but the sad reality is their souls have become so calloused that they are incapable of perceiving the voice of God's Spirit. Through persistent practice, evil has become good to them. Right is wrong, wrong is right, and they have become incapable of repentance because they have lost the power to discern evil. Let me say that again. Not all men in their present state can experience this God-given state of conviction. If you are under any conviction, I can assure you as a minister, you are the most blessed people of God on this earth. There are some men that have become so calloused in their state of evil they're, they have lost the power to even discern what it is. 
Proverbs 9.21, the Bible says, He who is often corrected hardens his neck and will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Well, Pastor, we're New Testament, okay? The Bible says in Mark 16, verse 16, Whosoever does not believe the gospel shall be damned. Words of Jesus Christ, by the way. Here's some more. In John 3, verse 18 and 20, the Bible says, He that believeth not on the Son of God is condemned to hell already, because he believeth not in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. Every one that does evil hates the light and will not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Conviction is not repentance. It is one of the most important parts of repentance. It is only an alarm in your soul and spirit that must be acted upon. It alerts you to the dangers and the drifting of your life, but you must respond to it. You can be convicted of your sins by the Holy Ghost without responding to the Spirit's compelling, compelling plead for you to come to repentance. But it is the most essential element of repentance. Before any man can come to the cross and have his sins forgiven, he must first be convicted of his sins by the Holy Spirit. This is the first step toward the kingdom of God. No man can enter the kingdom of God unless he repents of his sins, and no man can repent of his sins unless the Holy Spirit has convicted him of it. Second is contrition. The second element of repentance is contrition. Contrition, or godly sorrow as it is called in the Bible, is not shallow sentiment or empty emotion. It is a sincere regret over past sins and the earnest desire to walk in the new path of righteousness. Contrition is the acute awareness between the holiness of God and our complete unrighteousness. In Psalm 38, 34, verse 18, excuse me, Psalm 34, verse 18, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as have a contrite spirit, a spirit that has godly sorrow for what they've done. In Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart thou wilt not despise. In Isaiah 6, verse 5, the Bible says, Isaiah, after he had seen the Lord on his throne, he said, Then said I, Woe is me. For I am undone. In other words, I'm a dead man walking. That's sorrow. Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. The Bible records a very special fellowship with those that are of a contrite heart in Isaiah 57, verse 15. It is God's promise for the genuinely contrite. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. I will dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. Have you become broken because of your sins? Are you genuinely sorry for your sins or just sorry that you got caught? Is there, general, is there genuine contrition of what you have done in light of God's grace? Brokenness and godly sorrow for sin is the second step towards repentance. Number three, you have to change. True repentance carries with it the idea of changing everything in your life. If one is truly repentant, his will has to be brought into play. And he must make a commitment, a sincere commitment of his will to reverse the direction in his life. Changing your mind, changing your attitude, changing your ways, changing your behavior and your speech, among all other things. If one is truly repentant, he accepts that he must make a reversal of direction for his life, and God, seeing that earnest desire from his heart, cleanses, cleanses him from his sin at that point and gives him eternal life. 
The last element to repentance is your faith. Repentance is your first act of faith towards God. It is the first key that opens the door for all of the others. Repentance can only be initiated as a result of a person's first act of faith towards God. It takes true repentance and to commit our lives to Christ by faith. Repentance and faith go hand in hand. You cannot have saving repentance without saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can only receive, believe, and follow Jesus Christ by saving faith. We must receive Christ by faith. You cannot have true, genuine, saving faith unless there is true, genuine repentance. Mark eleven twenty two. the Bible says, have faith in God. And Hebrews eleven six. without faith it is impossible to please God. For to come to God you must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. 1 John 5, 4, the Bible says, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. I want to take a minute. Notes are put up. We're kicking back here. But I can't leave it at that. Voice in the Wilderness Ministries is calling men to repentance. Now, I know that many people think this is an outdated, you get more hate mail than you do, but this is the one thing that saved my soul. And I do not care what anybody says around me as far as what they do. Repentance is an essential element of how this works. The irony is, in this day and age, repentance, the doctrine of repentance, the narrative of repentance, the requirements of repentance, has been reduced to ticky-tack internet infighting over every vowel and syllable. It's more than just a simple prayer. It's more than just static emotion. It's more than a simple expression. This is life-changing. This is the most important decision you will make in your life. If you are going to a church that does not talk about repentance, and salvation, and the changing, and the ministry of the, of the transformation of the soul, you are in grave danger of falling into deception. This is your soul. This is your life. This is your eternity. You will treat your marriage, and you will treat your family, and you will treat the things that matter to you. This has to be even more so. God does not love you because you are great. God loves you because you're not. God does not love you because you're the perfect person. God loves you because you're not. God sent His Son to die for you because you are incapable of saving yourself without Him. This is God's display of love. And while we often talk about God's display of love and the grace of God, we have formatted this into an expression that you simply only have to say it, and then it is. It isn't that way. This is the most important time in your life. What you do at this moment when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin determines the rest of your life. And when you decide for Christ, eternity begins to live in you now. There are no shortcuts. And let me show you this very simply. God does not grade on the curve. And God is not a grandfather. You may have gone to church all of your life. You may have been around church all of your life. Church is as important as any other doctrine, but unless you're saved and under the blood and living for Christ, you are separated from God. There are other religions that have rewrote this. There are other Christian faiths who deny this. It is a free-for-all. This is the truth. And it's the truth because you don't hear it very often. This has become an opportunist heaven. You must be very dangerous. It's, it's become very dangerous. You have to be careful with your words. If you're not sure that you're going to heaven, if you have no in your heart that you have entered into church or the Christian faith other than through this narrow door, narrow path and narrow door, I'm compelling you from the bottom of my heart as a watchman 
who's called to call men to repentance. I'm compelling you by the Holy Spirit. Give your heart to God. Don't take for granted that you are in the kingdom of God unless your sins have been dealt with because you will not be in the kingdom of God unless your sins are dealt with. People make mistakes. People, bad things happen. Repentance is just as valid for the Christian. Christ said five times in the book of Revelation, repent to the churches. Repentance does not stop at salvation. Repentance is a lifestyle. The recognition of sin and the repentance of it is the restoration of man back to God. It's a commitment to God from your heart. It's that important. Please don't take it lightly. Darren and I have given our times and our lives and our souls to seeing souls get saved. Please consider our words, consider our motives, consider our results. All we care about is that the message is seen. We can't save you. Only the Holy Ghost can bring you to that. But we do hope that these words will make you think. In Jesus' name, amen.